Inside Scoop Virginia. My name is George Burke, and we're here for another hour tonight. Uh, I'm honored to have a couple of incumbent uh, delegates with me, Vivian Watts from the 39th Delegate District, and Mark Sickles from the 43rd. Vivian, sort of the rose between two thorns here. <laughs> Uh, Vivian has served in the General Assembly as a delegate for 16 of the last 26 years. Uh, she was Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth under Governor Belisles. Uh, both are, in essence, both she and Mark are unopposed this time. Vivian does have an independent green running against her. Uh, I'll call her Madam Invisible because, quite frankly, we couldn't remember her name. Uh, Mark was first elected in 2003. Uh, re-elected in 2005 and obviously you're going to get re-elected in 2007. Uh, Mark is a former chair of the Fairfax County Democratic Committee. Uh, he's the president of United... Uh, uh, was. What was the president of United Community, Community Ministries, Ministries mm -hmm. which is a social service agency. And many years ago you worked as a legislative assistant to Gladys Keating, yes, so sir, you have a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, 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 heritage, so to speak, tradition within the General Assembly. Um, let's get right into it and talk about the transportation bill. It seems every show I do, we have, uh, 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 we end up talking about it. People have a, a variety of different viewpoints. There certainly were some good things in the bill. There were some bad things. Where do we go? Good, bad. What did we do? <laughs> what did we do, right? Well, good, bad, glass half full, glass half empty. Glass half full is that we did make significant progress in local funding. And the money's raised here, it stays here, it is a significant amount of money, which can be as much as around 400 million if everything is fully enacted. And, and that is good. The bad news is that the need is a billion dollars a year, not 400 million. Mm -hmm. And the bad news also is that uh, the state just didn't ante up. That for every two dollars that we're putting in, the state's only putting in one dollar. Our need again is of the neighborhood of a billion dollars a year. When you look at all of our transit needs, besides additional road capacity, besides, and, and I'm very familiar with this in my district in particular, all of those bottlenecks, all of those mm -hmm. intersections that should work much better than they do. And uh, again, we've got a long way to go, but particularly on the fairness side of it, the state has got to stay a major player in transportation. It becomes uh, particularly unfair to Northern Virginia to be putting in uh, $2 for every dollar the state's putting in. And there were some other aspects that are also uh, need to be addressed as far as the fairness aspect. George, huh? yeah, 75 percent of the new money is in the two regional uh, areas, Northern Virginia and the Hampton Roads area, which it's targeted to. The uh, infamous abuser fee part of it, which I hope is repealed this winter, is in the statewide portion of the bill, which also had a couple of minor adjustments to fees. But the statewide uh, funds for transportation are a lot less than they ought to be, and it's hurting us in the maintenance area. Uh, Northern Virginia only is getting 11 percent of the total maintenance money, which uh, VDOT spends somewhere around 1.4, 1.5 billion a year on maintenance, and we don't get our fair share of that, partly because our infrastructure is a little bit newer, but partly because uh, it's not based on formula, but they put together a budget and we're not, we're just not doing well. And we need to drill down on that to make sure we do better. But every dollar that gets shifted from construction into maintenance, which we've been doing for years now, um, is money that hurts Northern Virginia worse than it hurts other areas. Because uh, we do fairly well in the construction formula. It's not perfect. There's one aspect of it that's not good, but we get the lion's share of transit money. And Vivian didn't mention, but she, uh, uh, she has in her newsletter and other places that uh, the, uh, uh, this bill was very pro-transit, the, probably the biggest transit bill that we've done so far. It's not what we ought to do, not where we've got to head into the future to get people out of cars uh, and onto public transit, but it's the biggest single step we've taken in that regard. You had a, a piece in that bill too, relative to the surplus. Something yeah, to do with the surplus. Well, it was it was my bill originally. It was uh, adopted by others, but uh, it it mandates at the end of the year there's a couple of legal obligations when you come to the end of the fiscal year, which is uh, June 30th, where the surplus goes. The biggest place it goes is into the rainy day fund, the Re revenue stabilization fund. 
But when that obligation is met and another obligation to clean water, which is mandated by code, uh -huh. after those two obligations are made, 67% uh, of all the money uh, that's left over will go into transportation. So it's not, um, it's not something that's going to solve transportation problems, but at least we will, uh, when we hear this rhetoric sometimes about uh, we have a surplus, why isn't that going into transportation? We won't have that anymore mm -hmm. because when we do have a uh, surplus at the end, it will be going to transportation, and I think that's good for Northern Virginia. But when you look at the long-term sustained meeting our needs, which is, again, a billion year after year after year, uh, the surplus is an important aspect, but it's basically a one-shot as it comes up. It, it again, right. does extremely well for, for certain projects, again, like intersection mm -hmm. improvements. But for the sustained funding that you need to have, uh, you need to have an ongoing source of revenue that we just don't have under this. A transportation bill. This is the first transportation bill, I think, since you were Secretary of Transportation. Is that correct? Yeah, it's been 20 years. And so I, I'm going to step forward and say it's been 20 years since we've addressed any in new funding. So one of the aspects of the abuser fees, which I couldn't agree more with Mark, that we've just, that, that they were so misdirected. But one of the things that bothers the public above all is that it's only on Virginia residents because of the way in which our Virginia Constitution was, was set up. You can't put the money to transportation uh, if it's a, a across the board fine. It's been 20 years. Every other state has increased their gas tax, and we haven't. Now, I realize what, what we're seeing right now in the world market on oil, we've got a problem. But we've also got a problem because a lot of our construction dollar goes to asphalt. Mm -hmm. And asphalt's a petroleum product. We've yep. seen almost a hundred percent increase in costs, whereas the the amount of revenue that we've gotten for the gasoline tax does not keep up with that because it's a per gallon tax. It's not a value tax. It's not an inflation uh, driven tax. The way the the price of gasoline bounces around every week and it's going up again as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think we may even see maybe not a new high, but it's going to go up substantially given what the price of the barrels of oil are these days in the, in the oil futures. That's what's on the news tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, a several pennies on the gas tax would have basically accomplished what a lot abuser. of what the abuser fees or more, uh, more mm -hmm. three cents would have been more than yeah. the abuser mm -hmm. fees will provide with yeah. funding. Yeah. And it's still a user fee. There's mm -hmm. no one source at all that could ever solve or even address our transportation uh, needs at the infrastructure that we need. But you've got to make sure that all players are at the table and to let off the tourists and the commercial mm -hmm. vehicles moving through the state uh, just again does not make sense. So at some point we've got to look look at that comprehensive uh, uh, need to address our, our real problems rather than mm -hmm. just, because even the bill that we see is based on borrowing on the state side. Well, that can only last for about eight years and we'll have 25 years of debt service to pay off. So while we have a need for a quick start on some of these projects, it is not the the long-term answer that we've got to put in place uh, for our capital needs. George, I think one thing you find with the gas tax is when you do a statewide poll, it's not popular and it scares people. But whenever I've talked to a group of citizens and I tell them 21 years ago, we, the gas tax was 15 cents a gallon in Virginia. We raised it two and a half cents to 17 and a half cents 21 years ago. And that's what it's been ever since. With no accommodation for inflation, we've grown by two million people in the Commonwealth over that period. I mean, when people hear that, they say, well, it's only logical that we should address that. So um, we, have, we have, have a counter argument that the cars are more fuel efficient now, so you don't raise as much revenue. And there's some truth in that, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, helping uh, people or incentivizing people to buy cars with a greater gas mileage is a good public uh, purpose mm -hmm. in itself. The, uh, my viewers are well aware that I like to have Democrats on my show since I'm a Democrat and I always like to do a little Republican bashing and uh, I would suggest and I, uh, I hope you agree with me that the, there was a little cowardice shown by the majority party 
in the General Assembly mm -hmm. this time. Yeah, if the gas tax were just called a user fee, uh, it, it might have been different. But the, the, the humor that I find in the position that I will never, ever, ever raise a tax is that most fees and charges it's not humorous, it's gallows humor, only apply to Virginia residents. Mm -hmm. And so that the humor of being a populist who says, I'll never raise your taxes, the flip side of that a stance always was, I'll raise his, not yours. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're not seeing. And again, what we're seeing is rhetoric, but we're not seeing the kind of, of long-term sustained funding that's got to go into this basic function of government. Or the old Republicans saw of will borrow it now and we'll worry about paying for it later. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've seen it yes. on the federal level yeah, and I, I think do. we're seeing it, them try to institute the same mm -hmm. thing here, although it's a little tougher to do in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to the budget. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't fully understand the Virginia budget process. I think <laughs> I understand the federal budget process uh, a little better yeah. uh, from my years on the Hill. But the bottom line is this will be the governor's, truly the first budget and he gets to do two, I guess. He does this one, and he does one that he leaves to yeah. his success. That's right. That's right. And, and his last budget was really Mark Warner's budget as mm -hmm. opposed to Tim Kaine's budget. So this will be his first one. Uh, but you folks will certainly play a role in carrying, attempting to carry that budget mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. uh, uh, through the General Assembly. And, and there will be certainly some hostility there. You'll, be, you'll have to be crawling through the weeds and fighting every step of the way. Uh, how about a little explanation of the budget process and then where we see the budget going? What are the important components of it? Uh, in one sense, the budget is a two-year planning document because we definitely do visit it every year. Mm -hmm. So you make all your adjustments for the economy. And that's a particularly important perspective given what we're currently going through. Um, the housing downturn is definitely affecting state revenues. It's just, just a matter of local real estate tax revenue. But we have the recordation tax. We took the sales tax, the state sales tax off in food so that the sales tax now is much more responsive to discretionary purchases than it mm -hmm. was before. Uh, we're, we've also lost significant revenue from small contractors. Uh, almost record refunds uh, have had to go back to contractors whose estimated income it doesn't match at all what they had the previous year. So that's where we're looking then at the $640 million current budget deficit. And uh, again, because these adjustable rate mortgages uh, are not by any means over in their effect on the economy, as more will be coming due, uh, we're looking at this next two-year budget that the governor will put forward. He's not being at all optimistic about revenue growth, but being a very conservative budget. Because again, obviously the most the most significant difference between the federal budget and the state budget is we have to balance our budget. And you're going to have, and I'm going to ask you to hold, Mark. We'll come right back to you. We're going to be breaking in a minute. Uh, but you're going to have local communities. You're going to have counties and cities that are absolutely going to be strapped as well mm -hmm. with yep. the declining property values, et cetera. We're going to be uh, breaking for two minutes. You're watching Inside Scoop Virginia. My name is George Burke. Our guests today are Delegate Vivian Watts and Martin Sickles. Uh, I urge you to give us a call if you're watching at 571-749-1166. This is Mommy's bed. Me and Jenny were jumping on it. Mommy's gun fell on the floor. I was a cowboy. Bang, 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 bang. I said, Jenny, wake up, wake up. It's just pretend. But she wouldn't wake up. If you give me a fish. If you give someone a fish. You feed them for a day. Teach someone to fish. You feed them for a lifetime. Give me a fish, and you'll feed me for a day. Teach me to fish, and you'll feed me for a lifetime. Through Volunteers of America, you can help change lives in your community. Oh, hey, 
Mr. Studied Algebra in school and got a better job than I could. You take the last call. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Stuck in an entry-level job because you only learn basic math. I don't have a boss riding my butt like you do, so you take it so you can get back to your desk. <laughs> you know, I probably should, but maybe Miss AP Calculus with the $200 haircut in the big office upstairs would like a cup. Oh, no, Mr. What was your name again? Never mind, it doesn't matter. I'm too busy doing important things to care. I just came down for some sweet and stir. You know, if my limited math abilities weren't keeping me from getting a better job, I'd quit this afternoon. I don't blame you. But thank goodness you're stuck here because we really need someone to make the coffee. <laughs> Line it up, baby. Who do you got? Uh, Line it up, baby. You know, I always had it. He didn't come in until after the district year. I said this. Welcome back to Inside Scoop, Virginia. My name is George Burke. Our guests today are Vivian Watts of the 39th Delegate District and Mark Sickles of the 43rd District. And I'm happy to have them today. One of the things I wanted to add uh, as we, uh, we're going to go back into discussing policy issues but uh, both of these uh, legislators, although neither of them have opposition, so to speak, uh, are working hard for other candidates. They're out there knocking on doors. Uh, they're still meeting with their constituents. And while they certainly want, you want your constituents to vote for you, they're not asking for themselves this time. They're asking for other candidates like George Barker uh, and, and Chap Peterson and others who are running within their districts. Um, so let's get right back to the budget, Mark. Well, it, it's going to be a difficult year for the governor, and he's already working to put together a budget that uh, has been working on it that will be released sometime in early December. And, and it's a little bit scary with the revenues being down. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things they have to do to start out the budget is going to estimate how the economy is going to grow the next couple years. And we were off just by a fraction last time, and it's resulted in a $600 million dollar shortfall, which to put in context is not that great in a state as big as ours and as financially well managed as ours and, and pretty well positioned. But he has to be careful. Uh, he wants to uh, uh, start a, a, uh, advance what we're doing now on a four-year-old pre-K education because the uh, research shows that we need to prepare children for schools and for public school and a lot of children in Virginia are not being prepared to get into kindergarten and, and be at the same place where their peers are. So um, we, he's doing a very good job uh, going around the state now talking about this issue. And his, uh, his ultimate goal is to spend $75 million on it, but that will be over many years building up to the program, building on what we do now and Head Start for the poorest kids and, and moving on up into the uh, uh, kids that have more resources. Now, of course, what? up in Northern Virginia, a lot of parents have very good uh, school right now. That's for what I was going to say. One of the things that we sometimes get a little jaded because uh, we, you know, Northern Virginia is a high income area, uh, high level of education, uh, but there are many other parts of our Commonwealth where uh, people don't live quite at the same per capita income and level and you know obviously the governor has to be the governor for the entire state not just for Northern Virginia and I think we have a responsibility to make sure that uh, and including those who may have less mm -hmm. up here in Northern Virginia as well that they have the same benefits yeah. the same right to an education well, and they get right. to the same level because the, em the employers are coming to Virginia particularly to Northern Virginia, because of the quality of the education yeah. and the quality of the, the workforce. Well, we need to make sure that local government elsewhere is doing what they need to do and are not going to rely on mm -hmm. uh, Northern Virginia taxpayers to fund this program. So it's a balance, mm -hmm. but we are, as you say, all in this together. Uh, we're, we drew those lines many years ago, and we're all together in a sense, and we, we uh, go up or down together. And so. We have a responsibility there. But one of the challenges, and one hopes when this election is over with, that we can come back and govern in, in, in the middle, because it'll, we, it'll take all the cooperation to guard the 
funds from the state that go to Fairfax County Schools. While you are absolutely right as far as the diversity of the state, and we have one of the greatest spreads between wealth and poverty of any state in the union, mm -hmm. the issue also is in our individual schools here in Fairfax County, we have very serious needs where we do have children who would qualify for pre-K because they qualify for uh, free or, or subsidized uh, uh, lunch. And this, every two years, another aspect of the budget is to what's called re-benchmark, to look again at the school funding formula. So this is where it's going to take every member of Fairfax County's delegation to be fully informed and heads up on the details of that uh, uh, formula review uh, so that uh, it's also a matter of not only the quality of the education, but also a matter of the burden that our real estate tax has to mm -hmm. absorb. George, I believe about uh, on the higher education end of the scale too, about 11 or 12 percent of our entire state budget goes to higher education. One thing that we have to remember to remind people in Northern Virginia is our kids from here take more advantage of our higher education system than any place else in the state. So when you talk about getting our fair share uh, in these schools, we have uh, 20 to 40 percent of any public college or university in the state is, is uh, populated with students from our area. At one time a couple years ago, 28 percent of the student body at UVA was from Fairfax County alone. We could, we could populate the whole all of UVA's freshman class with qualified students from our county, but that wouldn't be fair either. So we are taking advantage of the resources there. Now in the budget downturn, it's easiest to cut higher education uh, easier than it is other areas of the budget because of tuition. You have the, you can raise tuition on families, which is another tax for people, mm -hmm. and we already have tuitions that are high relative to other states. and so. That's what I'm worried about and am going to be concerned about in the governor's new budget, that we don't do what we did in the 90s to higher education. And George, we absolutely can't leave the budget discussion without also talking about another major funding uh, need that has been tragically exposed, and that is our mental health services, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we realize how critical it is that meaningful mental health services not long waiting lists where people can't get in for the services or they only get perfunctory uh, attention uh, be addressed as a preventative measure. Again, not only out of the tragedy that we saw at Virginia Tech or the, the horrific situation that occurred at the uh, Chantilly Police substation, but also I serve on the Veterans uh, Services Board mm -hmm. and uh, many people Fortunately, because unfortunately, because we've tended to, to push this, people don't want to talk about it, but are now aware of the reality of brain injuries and post-traumatic stress syndrome. And particularly since so many of our returning uh, uh, combat uh, military are coming back out of the guard and the reservists, they're not coming back to a base setting of the type of support that one would expect for a combat soldier but in fact they're coming back into our communities and the need to have the mental health services there for them and for their families uh, when you've got uh, violence, uh, depression, uh, uh, substance abuse, those issues as some of the problems of war surface, uh, we need to be there in assistance. Now at the same token, we'll be working uh, strongly with VA to make sure that what they qualify for, we have a shared cost there, but we need to have services in place. It's, I think it's really a serious problem. We're already seeing cases where people are coming back uh, with post-traumatic stress syndrome and the like, and they're getting drummed out of the army without anything because they mm -hmm. had quote unquote pre-existing conditions. And this is, I find that to be criminal, mm -hmm. quite frankly. And this is where under the initiative of uh, Governor Warner uh, restructured our veteran services because we hadn't been giving the same kind of support that other states have to uh, work with the veterans. We mm -hmm. now have two uh, veteran services officers here in Northern Virginia for the first time. We put them in place a year and a half ago to work directly with 
uh, the veteran to make sure that their disability rating is uh, fairly uh, determined. And we're even going, uh, we hope to launch very soon, and there's some national interest in it, a project called uh, uh, TurboVet. And we've already looked into the copyright of the name, but basically only 20% of applications uh, are actually, uh, can proceed forward. Typically, all of them have to go back to the vet. You didn't fill it in right. You didn't include this. And it's very important for the long-term meeting of the needs of that veteran uh, and their families and making sure that the, the financial responsibility is where it should be, not just on local services, but the VA stays a player in this one. One can only hope that uh, the Commonwealth sets an example for the federal government, because right now I think they're failing miserably yeah. <coughs> in terms of mm -hmm. how they're treating these mm -hmm. returning soldiers. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, it's only going to get worse. I mean, we have a lot of, of wounded veterans, wounded soldiers coming back who, quite frankly, in Vietnam mm -hmm. would have never survived. That's, That's right. True as well. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 uh, the miracles of modern medical yep. science and uh, the like, and finally, <laughs> let's hope the armor, I yeah. mean, that took a while, yeah. um, has created yeah. a whole generation. I mean, forget just the people missing limbs right. and the like, because I see some of them, quite frankly, on the ski slopes now. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. programs, Wounded Warriors, right. they call it, and some of these mm -hmm. things, because uh, I teach skiing in the wintertime. Uh, but it's, a, uh, it's just a serious problem. I'm really glad to hear uh, that uh, we're looking to, to take that extra step yeah. in that area. It, it's one thing the Democratic Party is going to do in Richmond this, this year is look at all these issues with regard to veterans and coming back. And you're absolutely right, George. Uh, this war and the two wars that we're in now are going to have far-reaching uh, impacts for our budget in years to come both at the federal level and, and at the state level. The, you know, some Republicans criticize they don't understand that whether you favor the war or oppose the war, what you think about the war has nothing to right. do with the, the troops coming Absolutely. back. You know, there were, there were some serious mistakes made when people came back, when our people yes. came back from Vietnam. Right. Uh, the country was tremendously divided and those, those, those veterans were left in a lurch. Yep. And we cannot afford uh, to let that happen again. And I don't think it is in terms yeah. of the citizenry, in terms of the public. Right. And it's certainly that is, is, it's only a political football because the Republicans don't want to pay. Right. Uh, and this administration doesn't yeah. want to pay. Luckily, he Senator Webb is working on this issue. He's got a bill to have the full GI Bill returned to, similar to what we had for the greatest generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, uh, there was a piece in the Post on Senator Webb the other night that was talking about how far he has come in such a short period of time, mm -hmm. to a great degree because of, of, of his knowledge in, in the whole theater of war and veterans and the like, but on other issues as well. It's time for us to take another break. Uh, my name is George Burke. You're watching Inside Scoop Virginia. Our guests have been Vivian Watts and Mark Sickles, both delegates here in Fairfax County. Vivian's going to leave us now. Thank you for joining us. I know you have you, another George. meeting, and we'll see you in two minutes. Some people in Fairfax County don't know what public access means. Some think it's just another channel on the dial. But it's much more than that. It's the voice of the people. People like you. Your neighbors, your friends, or your family. People who want to share ideas, opinions, cultures, lifestyles, art, sports, music, events, entertainment, history, science, beliefs, people who want to learn about television, producing, directing, cameras, audio, lighting, editing, or radio, talk, music, whatever you think people should hear. Public access is the place where everyone has a voice. And it's the place where that voice gets heard. A place where you can create your own form of personal expression. So what do you want to say? Whatever it is. You can say it here. Because we're public access. For the people. By the people. It is about balancing our choices between the gray of the concrete jungle and the stunning beauty of the real one. Between a stoic facade of granite and the fury of the canyon. It's why there's Earthshare, the simple way to find balance. Earthshare is the workplace giving program bringing the leading environmental groups under one umbrella. Support Earthshare, support them all. Earthshare, please ask your employer about workplace giving. To learn more, visit our website.
Thousands of kids in this country have everything it takes to go to college, except the money. The United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Commercials. Welcome back to Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm your host, George Burke. Uh, you feel free to give us a call at 571-749-1166. Uh, you now stuck with the two thorns. We <laughs> lost our rose, uh, Vivian Watts. Uh, Mark Sickle represents the 43rd Delegate District uh, here. It's all in Fairfax County. It's a little all bit in of, Fairfax. It's all Fairfax. Uh, some of the address is Alexandria, but it's all within the county. Mark serves on the Commerce and Labor Committee. He serves on uh, the Health Welfare and Institutions Committee and the Privileges and Elections Committee. Let's talk a little bit more about mental health. You've uh, played sure. a, a pretty major role on some issues well, in, within the legislature. Well, George, uh, we're looking at all the issues that stem from uh, Virginia Tech uh, and the tragedy uh, last April in our committee. Um, the committee chairman uh, uh, has said that the biggest problem we have is funding and really not policy, but there are a couple of policy issues that we're going to address and we're looking at the whole commitment process to make sure that it's done uh, in a way that uh, respects the rights of the, of the citizens who are mentally ill or alleged to be mentally mm -hmm. ill and their families who are desperate sometimes to, to seek help for people. One of the uh, things that hit home with me um, with this incident with a Fairfax County citizen who, who was uh, severely mentally ill is that the CSB, the Community Services Board, this is the agency around the state, uh, state, there's 40 of them that manage our mental health programs. And the one that covers the area that the university is in, in Blacksburg, is not well funded. Uh, and ours in, our, in Northern Virginia, in the Alexandria Falls, uh, Fairfax Falls Church mm -hmm. branch, Arlington, we're not well funded either, but Local governments make up the difference up here. Uh, we pay, uh, the majority of it comes from our own tax dollars up here. So again, when we want to try to fix the statewide system, um, we have to look at what the proper role is of local government versus state government because we're already belling up to, bar, to the bar, so to speak. In, in the situation in Blacksburg, um, the gentleman was given a um, an outpatient uh, treatment order that rarely occurs up here of 800 mental health commitments uh, last year in Fairfax County, only five on your hand were outpatient orders. And we have the staff here to follow up on those. In, in addition to that, mm -hmm. he fell through the cracks down there because it wasn't a well-funded system. And you don't know for sure whether it wouldn't have happened, but it, uh, it, if it had an inpatient commitment, obviously he would have gotten onto the Nick's background check, and he probably wouldn't have been able to purchase those two handguns one month apart uh, following Virginia law without any uh, flag coming up in that process. So le the governor has fixed that problem almost immediately after the incident, uh, but uh, the disparity between the systems is very great. Uh, we have been under court order in the past from judges on our mental health system. Uh, there's a debate in the community about community services versus institutions. It's going to go on and on, and uh, it's, a, it's a healthy debate, but we don't have uh, and have not historically done what we should have done and done what other states d have done on mental health. And HWI, our committee, is looking at what other states are doing to see what, with that, uh, whether we can borrow some practices and policies that work other places. So. Uh, there's going to be a lot of activity on that subject this winter, and I'm looking forward to helping improve the system. It's a shame that it takes a tragedy such as what happened at Virginia Tech, uh, Virginia Tech to wake some people up. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm glad to see that's moving forward. While we're on the issue of science, I don't usually talk about science a lot right. on these shows, and I promise you we are getting to politics. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you've been very active in that whole the research right. and science well, area and, and relative to higher education and the like. Let's talk about that. Well, I, I have been a little bit concerned that while Virginia's doing really well in the high-tech area, and we all know that's, that comes uh, fundamentally from the federal government's investment in defense mm -hmm. and homeland security in our area. And that has drawn companies, high-tech companies from around uh, the country and around the world to be here in our market. 
Uh, we're, we're not a leader in the biosciences area, and there's such great potential for the future to uncover the uh, uh, remedies and the, and the causes mm -hmm. of uh, diseases that have been in, inflicted on humans from you know, the beginning of time. And other states have plans and they, uh, strategies to, to uh, put their uh, position themselves to go after this stuff and work on it. And, and our neighbor to the north, Maryland, to their credit, this is one of their strengths. And a couple of years ago, they passed a tax credit law to help um, uh, seed, to give seed company money and tax credits for businesses that are based in Maryland. And I, I'm, I was afraid and am afraid that they will be stealing, you know, our best scientists from Virginia and elsewhere. up that 270 yeah, card. Yeah, absolutely, and, and other places in the state. And uh, I wanted to, uh, I had a bill that was similar, model on the Maryland bill, but uh, the uh, tax, under the leadership of the statesman, uh, John Chichester, who I really respect a lot, who's retiring, he is, was not uh, uh, in favor of tax credits at all. Mm -hmm. And now, with, now that he's leaving, maybe that'll have uh, some better life on the Senate side. But um, uh, my bill was transformed with the help on a bipartisan basis into a grant program for biotech startups. And, and unfortunately, it got to the floor and uh, with a lot of excitement from the bioscience, biotech community in Virginia and then was sent to appropriations committee. It didn't need to go to appropriations committee, so I argued against that, but it got sent there anyway to basically kill the bill last winter. It, it is, it's uh, something that we need to take seriously and get involved in, and uh, I would like to work so that Virginia is a leader in this area. We do not have a, an, a higher uh, education uh, institution in the state in the top 50 in research. And, Virginia Tech comes that surprises the closest. me. I would think that you know our, our universities are rated so highly. Uh, I would think that we would, but that well, is an area where we're deficient. We, we do have very good professional schools, and UVA Law School is is mm -hmm. renowned. William and Mary Law School and good business schools, uh, but in in sciences and biology, we're still behind a lot of states. We're trying to catch up at uh, VCU, Virginia, Virginia Tech, ODU. And, and others, but we have a long way to go. And this is the future economy. So this is this is really the underpinning of where we're going in the next century, and we just can't be caught behind on this. We've always, you know, the, our nation as a whole, they, they talk about, you know, how many engineering students are, are graduating every year in India versus how Absolutely. many engineering students are graduating here in the States, and how many foreign students are now graduating from our engineering yeah. schools. It's, I, it's yep. in essence, the same. Absolutely. Type of thing. We're looking more in state. Before I, I want to talk about a couple of, of other issues. I want to talk about the BRAC issue. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that I think a lot of our viewers are not aware of is how closely you work with the Board of Supervisors and Fairfax County government. How closely our delegation in Richmond yes. works, and the fact that that uh, Fairfax County sends down some of their regular employees who work in various mm -hmm. departments that have issues. Yes dealing with the legislature. Tell us a little bit about that. It's well, a, I, was, I learned recently how closely it, yes. really, it really is. It, it is critical that they're there, George. And I know this has come up in the campaign unbelievably that someone has criticized. Uh, I was Gary the, Bays criticizing <laughs> Jerry Conley. Of course, if you listen to Gary Bays, the Republican, you think that Fairfax is crumbling around us. And yeah. he, he made those statements before the Chamber of Commerce. Any group that's a booster yes. of Fairfax County, it's that crowd. We, we, we depend on the facts. And a lot, we do work closely with uh, the Board of Supervisors. Uh, sometimes we don't always agree with them, but it's critical that we know what their position mm -hmm. is. And in my, if I had a criticism of them, and I would tell them this, uh, is that they need to focus a little bit more because so much of the legislation we pass affects them and they I went to they have uh, legislative briefings that are open to the public every Friday afternoon when we're in session and I went to a couple of them and the number of bills that they were looking at was just amazing and and uh, we need to focus a little bit better on the top 10 20 that they really need and and uh, focus our delegation better on those bills but we do uh, we could not uh, function without the school lobbyists telling us you know, how the education proposals mm -hmm. affects Fairfax County, um, uh, the transportation area where uh, small changes in formulas or uh, specific uh, funding for transit or 
certain aspects of VRE or Metro, how it affects us. And so we we very much depend on them. It's, it's a small price to pay for the value that they bring to us. We are part-time legislators. We're citizen legislators. That's the way it ought to be. Uh, but government is so big and it affects us in so many ways now that uh, uh, having the support is critical. Uh, in that same vein, how much do the uh, delegates from the rest of the state resent us up here. I mean, I, yeah. I sit on the steering committee and the central committee of the, the state Democratic Party, and I feel it sometimes in that body yeah. where they just feel mm -hmm. we have everything, we get everything, we do everything, and you know, what about us? Uh, they really are, are jealous of the, uh, the tax base we have up here that allows us to have the kind of lifestyle and the quality of life that our citizens demand. Um, they, they are amazed by our school system and what we can offer our students here. Um, they, uh, they're amazed that companies are opening shop here almost every day, uh, wanting to come to our part of the state. Um, there is some jealousy, and frankly, it's going to get worse because the, when we do the census in a couple years from now, the rural areas are going to even lose more clout in the legislature. They've been losing it over decades and they're going to lose a little bit more. Um, uh, we need to care about rural Virginia, no question about it. And we, our farm economy is huge in the state. Mm -hmm. it, yep, uh, no it's doubt. a big export uh, market. It, or, you know, the transportation industry is huge in our state. Um, but uh, we need to do better here, bringing back uh, what we need from the state to take the burden off the homeowner that is, is so uh, high in our part of the state relative to the rest of the state. Hopefully the census and hopefully redistricting, uh, certainly depending on this election and the election in 09 when you'll certainly be up again and, and our members of our House of Delegates will be up again, uh, are critically important to where we stand after the year 2000. Breck, uh, we've got a couple of minutes uh, before the mm -hmm. break and uh, I know this is an issue that you and Vivian were dealing yep. with. And uh, it's, it's, it's an issue involving transportation, it's mm -hmm. an, an, an infrastructure, the providing of services, and dealing with an influx, mm -hmm. a huge influx of workers, and I presume population as well, ultimately. The, uh, probably. The, the, uh, it was 22,500 new workers coming to South Fairfax County that affects all of our districts down there. Uh, now it's been scaled back a little bit to 19,000. The engineer proving ground, which is in Vivian's district, just across 95 from me, mm -hmm. is where 8,500 are going to go. They've broken ground there last month for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. It used to be called the Defense Mapping Agency in years, and they're, they're in Bethesda now and other places, and they're consolidating in on our neighborhood, and we're excited about that. Well, we should be proud, we're, but we're, nonetheless, yeah, we have to deal with the, yeah, the we, problems. Big problems. Uh, we have not yet determined how even though they've broken ground on the buildings, how they're going to get in and out of the site. The, uh, the Secretary of Transportation, Pierce Homer, is working even as we speak on an MOU with the Army on those issues surrounding in, getting in and out of the uh, EPG and the missing link of the Fairfax County Parkway, the two and a half miles that aren't built between 95 and Rolling Road area uh, that have been caught up in a bureaucratic, bureaucratic quagmire with regard to environmental law and cleaning up the unexploded ordinance and oil spills that have been on the site and mm -hmm. right now they finally agreed uh, we are going to actually transfer money to the army uh, to pay and let them build the road uh, so we're excited about that vdot just couldn't transfer the land get the land transferred to them in a, a environmental condition that was suitable we shall be back in uh, two minutes um, and my guest is mark sickles 43rd Some people in Fairfax County don't know what public access means. Some think it's just another channel on the dial. But it's much more than that. It's the voice of the people. People like you. Your neighbors, your friends, or your family. People who want to share ideas, opinions, cultures, lifestyles, art, sports, music, events, entertainment, history, science, beliefs. People who want to learn about television. Producing. Directing. Cameras. Audio. Lighting. Editing. Or radio. Talk. Music. Whatever you think people should hear. 
Public access is the place where everyone has a voice. And it's the place where that voice gets heard. A place where you can create your own form of personal expression. So what do you want to say? Whatever it is. You can say it here. Because we're public access. For the people. By the people. It is about balancing our choices between the gray of the concrete jungle and the stunning beauty of the real one. Between a stoic facade of granite and the fury of the canyon. It's why there's Earthshare, the simple way to find balance. Earthshare is the workplace giving program bringing the leading environmental groups under one umbrella. Support Earthshare, support them all. Earthshare, please ask your employer about workplace giving. To learn more, visit our website. Thousands of kids in this country have everything it takes to go to college, except the money. The United Negro College Fund, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Welcome back to Inside Scoop Virginia. My guest is Mark Sickles of the 43rd Delegate District. If you want to call us, we're at 571-749-1166. Uh, tonight while we're live, otherwise we're pre-recorded and you'll be calling, but you won't get us. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we try to talk about on the show is what's happening with the politics. And uh, uh, we've got a lot of close races this time. Uh, I do want to tell a quick story, though, that, uh, uh, you know, you hear lots about negative campaigning. There are a lot of news stories about negative campaigning. The Republicans are screaming. The Democrats are campaigning negatively. The Democrats are screaming. The Republicans are. I like to think Republicans invented it. Uh, we're just learning how to respond appropriately. Uh, but there was a case a few years ago where uh, a so-called robocall, the calls everybody loves to hate, where you get the pre-recorded message that comes on, usually to your answering machine, but if you happen to answer the phone, you'll get it. And there was a call going around telling them that uh, Mark Sickles had passed away, and this happened yeah. not too uh, uh, long before the election. Yeah, right before the election. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's the right. ultimate yeah. negative campaign. <laughs> I survived it, so to speak. <laughs> I'm glad to see you still It was a very, very, very interesting uh, time. There's, uh, I've been involved in some tough races, and uh, it, it's not fun. Uh, and it, it's, it's been with us a long time, and it will be with us because people don't pay attention a lot of times, and the consultants out there think you have to knock them over the head to, to get them to come to uh, vote. And, you know, being against somebody is a more powerful Mm -hmm. a motiv motivator. Unfortunately, it's human nature, and that's why you see a lot of this. But I think by this time, George, a lot of people have kind of tried to filter through it, and it's a big mess out there now. And I, I think the election will probably get back to fundamentals. And I think it's going to be a very good year for the Democratic Party in Virginia because you know, you know we're the party of the center. We try to be the party of the center uh, to, to have moderation of keeping Virginia the number one business state. We want to do that. Uh, the business community in Richmond likes us in many cases a lot better than they like the other side just because we're interested in the same things they are. And that is uh, a transportation system that works for our economy and investment in education and human capital. The, what's going to take us to the next century as an economy. I was talking about that in the last segment a little bit. But the, uh, we do have some visionary business leaders in this state, and they can they look at our candidates and they they find the people that they find the message coming from these people more attractive. And um, I work around the country in my other job, and sometimes uh, I had to explain that in other states, and they don't have that kind of relationship. We we've, we've been a, very lucky here to develop a good environment uh, uh, where the uh, uh, where we can campaign in the middle and win elections here. I think it's, uh, it, it makes me laugh quite frequently, uh, uh, you know, the attacks that come from the Republicans uh, calling all the Democrats, quote unquote, liberals. And yet, who gets the Chamber of Commerce endorsements? Who gets the endorsements from these groups that are in the center, from these groups mm -hmm. that are looking to move Virginia forward? Right. And it tends to be the Democrats. And who are not the obstructionists uh, that, you know, if, if, if our transportation 
uh, network here in the state con continues to falter, we're going to lose business. Because right. if you can't get your products in and out of Virginia, right. you can't move your products, you can't operate out of yeah. Virginia. George, we have a, a big challenge in front of us just in Hampton Roads on that score because our port has been very successful there, mm -hmm. the Virginia Port Authority, and we're growing at a rapid rate because world trade is exploding. And uh, we've got a long-term plan for the harbor down there, but the biggest, the biggest challenge is going to be once the, once the cargo gets to the uh, road network, how is it going to get that? What you know, up sixty four, up, to, up 64 <laughs> and where we have will we have adequate rail capacity? A lot of investments are being made in that, but more need to be made. And you don't hear a lot of talk about that in our area, uh, even though sometimes our local governments don't work well together in Northern Virginia. In Hampton Roads, it's a mess. There's 12 local governments. They they can't get along with each other. They can't agree to anything, and they've they've had a. Uh, uh, transportation program that we talked about in the last segment too, forced on them kind of against their will and uh, it's very controversial down there. W another thing we didn't mention about transportation is they're still pending lawsuits against it even though it's a marginal step Im improvement for our two congested regions uh, there are pending court cases could, that could strike these down, not on the abuser fee issue, but on other constitutional mm -hmm. claims. Transportation authorities and yeah, some other issues. Right. My, uh, my oldest son went to ODU, so I spent a lot of time going back and forth mm -hmm. and going through that tunnel and sitting on 64. And sure, I mean, our, our, you can't compare anything with our traffic up here, but that's a, it really is a close second at a certain, certain time of the day, certain times of the day, and during the summer when you have all the tourists and the, and the beach traffic coming back and forth uh, to our area, to Pennsylvania, to, to West Virginia. I mean, you know, Virginia Beach is a big draw, and all that, uh, the, the, the traffic, the commercial traffic coming out of there. If I'm not, uh, if I'm correct, I think that the Hampton Roads is the largest deep water port it on is. the East Coast. People think of New York or Boston <clears throat> or Philadelphia, but actually it's Hampton Roads. Yeah, it has a deepest entrance channel and <clears throat> other, Baltimore has a deep channel too now after a lot of work and New York's working on it. Yeah. So when the Panama, this is getting way off the subject, but when the Panama Canal gets improved, there, there's a huge battle going on for supremacy on the East Coast ports that Virginia is going to be a part of. Let's get back to politics. <laughs> the, um, we've got campaigns like uh, Chap Peterson and Jean Marie Devilites Davis. I mean, by the time they're done, they're going to spend a couple of million dollars. It's, it's pretty state amazing. Senate race. That's a, I, I suspect that's a new record in Virginia. It, it probably is. Uh, unfortunately, I think every two years uh, we have these headlines, this is the most expensive race, and that's, wh that's where we're headed. It's so competitive, and uh, uh, control of the General Assembly is, is really at risk and people are willing to put money up to try to affect it one way or the other. And part of it is, uh, you know, I have uh, made a living as a media consultant and doing that type of work for many years. And part of it is television. We are seeing a, literally a state senate race on broadcast television, which I, I mm -hmm. think even the public knows is prohibitively mm -hmm. expensive. Normally, if you go to television in a delegate or a senate race, you go on cable. Yeah. Not cheap, yep. but cheaper. You still pay the same kind of production cost to produce the ad, but you don't pay the kind of fees. But here you have a race where you're reaching 30,000, 40,000 people in one small district, but your signal, you're paying to reach four and a half West, million West people. West Virginia. Yeah, four and <laughs> a half plus million people in the, in yeah. the Washington metropolitan area. It's just astonishing. That has been a tough race, has been... Uh, some accusations back and forth. Uh, I think that you, you, behind the scenes you have Congressman Tom Davis looming, and I watch it very closely because I'm the 11th district chair, mm -hmm. and my job is to elect a Democrat to that seat. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, uh, I think that's a close one at it's this a, point. It is a close one, and uh, the two other Senate races in, in the county are close to the uh, Barker-O'Brien race uh, in Part of that's in my district. Mm -hmm. I believe you have nine, nine precincts. Nine right precincts there. of the 39. Yeah. And uh, the Barker campaign has been leaving no uh, stone unturned. And George is such an extraordinarily hard worker. Uh, he is out there every day knocking on doors. And the Senate seats are so big that uh, door knocking is a smaller factor than it would be in a district my size, where it takes an entire year 
-hmm. to do it right in, in a delegate size district. Uh, but George has been working on it from the beginning of the year. He had a primary, as you know, yeah. that was contested and he worked, that probably helped him in retrospect uh, uh, to build his name recognition over a wide district. So he's doing real well. He and literally I, runs, from what I hear, he literally <laughs> runs between houses. Yeah. And George, I saw him the other day and he's definitely lost a couple of pounds. George is in good shape now. He, uh, I, I needed to have a race on that for, for that <laughs> well, reason. I, I don't wish that upon <laughs> you. Uh, he, George has you know, this tremendous background in health care. Yeah, he does. Uh, I think he's got a couple of degrees out of Harvard. Uh, and he's the, the nicest guy you're ever going to meet. Mm -hmm. But when you get down and you start talking with him, it's amazing, his depth of knowledge. I mean, he'll be able to roll right into the, the state we, senate, I think, and be a player. We, we've, always, uh, we've always depended on him with regard to policy affecting our hospital and mm -hmm. medical services uh, facilities in Northern Virginia. As a member of HWI committee, I would see him uh, on a daily basis in Richmond, you know, working to make sure we do the right thing for our area. He, uh, you know, they, they started small and they had a primary, uh, but he, uh, they've just really forged ahead. I think they've just done everything right. And they, so their too. message has been that the voters are buying into Georgia's yeah. message. Uh, I'm going to predict that one that I think he's a winner. And yeah. uh, I hate to, to jinx anything because no. I don't want anybody to stay home because no. it's going to be awful. All these races are going to be awful close. No. You know, the Republicans are not sitting on their hands by any means. Right. Um, and we have another Senate race out there, too. Yeah, with uh, Ken Cuccinelli mm -hmm. and, and uh, Janet, Janet Olesek. Olesek. They were on uh, this show oh, probably about a month, a month mm -hmm. or so ago, and it was a pretty spirited discussion. Obviously, he's a trial lawyer, uh, mm -hmm. but he has some awful extreme views. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting when he was here, he tried to play Mr. Moderate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you know where he stands and then you listen to him, uh, and he's eloquent, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, as a trial lawyer is going to be, it gets a little scary sometimes to me, and I certainly wish Janet the best of luck in that race. You know, it, it's amazing to me, it always has been amazing to me, that we have people elected in this county uh, that, have, that hold the most extreme positions possible on things like a woman's right to choose. And uh, that's going to matter someday because the Supreme Court of the United States is... Is it has the ability any time to, to change the current law, and then it'll be up to us in Virginia to decide what our policies are. And we actually have people that vote that life begins at fertilization and not at pregnancy, mm -hmm. not even at pregnancy. And the implications of that for, for um, in vitro fertilization for in, infertile couples to uh, uh, emergency contraception, things like that, are very serious. We're going to have to end on that note. I hope you enjoyed our show, and uh, we'll be back next Monday. Thanks a lot for watching Inside Scoop Virginia, and thank you, Mark. Good to be here, George.